Hello, this is another in the series of technical overviews of magnetic separators manufactured by Bunting in Redditch. My name is Neil Rousen. I am the laboratory manager at Bunting's and also uh, Emeritus Professor of Minerals Engineering at the University of Birmingham. Today we're going to talk about the rare earth roll permanent magnetic separator. This is a high intensity dry magnetic separator used in the processing of mineral occurrences, uh, ceramic materials, plastics, abrasives, and also we're beginning to see it being used in the urban uh, waste industry processing shredded and granulated, uh, finely shredded and granulated scrap materials. Uh, the talk itself will last about 20 minutes or so and hopefully it will be of interest to you. So first of all we'll talk a little bit about the types of particles that we see in uh, in a, a magnetic separation application. First of all, the ferromagnetic materials. These are mag the materials that are capable of a high degree of magnetic alignment. They are separated out at very, very weak magnetic fields. Um, examples of this would be fine iron that's generated in the ball milling and rod milling of mineral deposits to get them down to the required size for processing. Um, also, there are some minerals that are uh, ferromagnetic in nature, for example, most notably magnetite Fe304, which is capable of being separated at a magnetic field strength in the region of 400 to 800 Gauss, so that's a very weak magnetic field strength. There are also some chemical elements that are ferromagnetic in nature, for example, cobalt and nickel, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. So ferromagnetic materials are easy to remove, uh, however, um, they can create a problem um, if you're processing them along with paramagnetic particles simply because they tend they can block uh, the separation of the paramagnetic particles and inhibit the performance of the uh, magnetic separator. So consequently we tend to um, remove the ferromagnetic particles prior to putting the, the, the feedstock over a higher intensity magnet. It's what we call magnetic scalping. So for example, for the, um, the rare earth roll we're going to talk about today, we would usually recommend that the feed goes over a low intensity ferrite drum to remove any uh, tramp magnet that might make material that might be there and any fine iron. And we'll talk a bit more about that uh, a bit later on. There's paramagnetic materials. Most mineral oxides and sulfides that we see in a mineral application are paramagnetic in nature. That's a positive magnetic uh, susceptibility that means that the particle is moved towards a concentration in lines of flux in the separating zone of our magnetic separator. Now all minerals uh, have a fingerprint magnetic susceptibility that allows us to estimate the type of magnetic field strength needed to separate them in a magnetic separator. So for example, if we have any uh, uh, the examples given here are uh, ilmenite, which is an iron titanate material, has a, a, a considerable magnetic susceptibility and is highly paramagnetic in nature, which means that it will be separated out at a field strength in the region of 6,000 to 8,000 Gauss. Now, an 8,000 Gauss uh, field strength is unlikely to separate out hematite because that is much more weakly paramagnetic. Uh, in nature, and I probably need something in the region of 12 to 16,000 Gauss to remove the same size particle. So we, by knowing what's in our feedstock of material, then we can estimate what sequence we can remove these these materials, uh, these minerals in, and what sort of field strength we need as a starting point for our experiments to optimize the flow sheet. So. Diamagnetic materials are really non-magnetic materials to all intents and purposes, and these tend to be industrial minerals such as silica sands, talcs, and calcium carbonates. They pass through the magnetic separator unaffected by the magnetic field and will exit via their, uh, their uh, centrifugal force in the case of the induced roll separator, or in the case of a high intensity wet separator, they will, they will exit by gravity. So really, I have three different types of behavior. Highly magnetic material, I have weakly magnetic paramagnetic minerals, and I have my non-magnetic um, 
materials, which are usually my industrial minerals. So my applications that I usually look at are either getting rid of ferro and paramagnetic minerals from uh, a valuable diamagnetic material like a silica sand for glass making, or the concentration of a valuable paramagnetic material like ilmenite by the removal of um, diamagnetic materials such as the silica sands, the zircons and the rutiles that will be there. Um, so it's, it's usually a concentration of magnetics or a removal of magnetics from a non-magnetic uh, feedstock. To do that, either way, it, we use the same magnetic force equation, which is the magnetic force generated on a particle in a magnetic separator, Fm, is equal to the volume of the particle multiplied by its magnetic susceptibility, multiplied by the field strength, multiplied by the field gradient, which is the rate of change of flux within the magnetic separator. That gives me my magnetic force. So it's pretty obvious that a, the magnetic force on a magnetic susceptible particle like ilmenite with a high magnetic uh, susceptibility is going to be far greater than it will be on a silica sand that has practically a zero uh, magnetic susceptibility. So first fact to consider is we split them into two. There's feed variables which are based upon the, the client specification, if you like, uh, which is the volume of the particle here, which is the particle size range uh, of the material that we're processing. You can see that the larger V is, then the greater the magnetic force we generate, which is a reason why as your feed range gets lower and lower and we start getting down to sort of below 100 microns in size range, we start needing very, very high magnetic field strengths and gradients to separate them out because the amount of force we're, we're be able to impart into that paramagnetic particle gets less and less as the volume drops. The magnetic susceptibility of the particle is a function of its geology and, its, and the mineralogy of the samples that we, that we use. So a, a particle is, you know, is either highly paramagnetic, mediumly paramagnetic or, or, or weakly paramagnetic. The only way you can actually change that is by heat treatment, which some, in some iron ore processes, the, the, the client will heat treat the material to alter its magnetic susceptibility at 600 degrees, for example, up to 1000 degrees. And that gives you a phase change, which gives you a, a change in magnetic susceptibility. But that's not very often done at all. What we can control at Bunting Redditch is the machine operating variables, which is the magnetic field strength, H, of the of the separator that we're using and the magnetic field gradient, which is H divided by R, the rate of change of flux in the machine. The higher both of these are, the better, but that is with the caveat that you, uh, in advertising, is the, the magnetic field strength is often quoted as being a key factor. It is important, but it, it's, it's, it's equally important that you have a high field strength uh, as well as a high field gradient, H, DR. It's a combination of those two factors that gives you the separation force that you're generating in your separator. So it's not always the magnetic field strength that is the most important thing. You can have a medium um, field strength separator with a very, very high field gradient and that will give you outstanding performance. Just an example, if I had a two Tesla 20,000 Gauss uh, separator, and I had a magnetic field gradient of zero within my machine, then H divided by R is going to be zero, and my whole magnetic force will be zero. Nothing will be removed in the magnetic separator. So it has to be a combination of those two things that give us our performance. So any separation in a physical separator is a balance of forces. In the case of the rare earth roll, it is a balance of the forces I generate in the centrifugal force I generate on the particle going over the roll and the force I generate from the magnetic front pulley of the machine. And a trade-off for those will give me the trajectory of the particle as it leaves the separator. So just to illustrate that, uh, I have Fm, which is my magnetic force, 
Uh, I have FC, which is the centrifugal force of the separator that we're using, uh, which is the master roll. This is the rare earth separator here. This is my permanent front pulley that's generating my magnetic force. I have three types of particle that I'm processing over. I have my yellow particles, which are my magnetics. These will be something like an ilmenite, which has a high magnetic susceptibility. So I can generate a high magnetic force, which means that when I run the separator uh, and I feed material on, my yellow particles are captured by the magnetic force I'm generating. It's significantly higher than the centrifugal force and it comes off this side of the splitter plate into the magnetics uh, chute that comes off the, the separator. My non-magnetics, in this case silica, has no magnetic susceptibility at all, so Fm is equal to zero, and it's thrown off by its, the centrifugal force generated from the, the revolution of the roll, which is I could control by my, uh, by my control panel. Just to complicate things slightly, they will often in a mineral processing application be what we call middlings particles. These are particles uh, that contain small grains of magnetic particle within a matrix of non-magnetic particles. So these are a mixture of both materials and so they have a composite magnetic susceptibility between very low and very high which means that their foot, they have a balance of forces that leads them to be slightly deflected into the middling section here. Now what I do with those is entirely up to to me, really, I can combine the middlings and the non and the magnetics and discard them in the case of a silica sand processing option, uh, leaving me with a very clean non-magnetic fraction. However, if if uh, I have some, if I want more of the valuable uh, clear white mineral, I could recycle this through my flow processing sheet, flow sheet, crush it finer liberate the white mineral from the yellow mineral, feed back through my separator again to get more white mineral and more yellow mineral out from the process. Because now the particle size range is finer and I'm liberating my yellow from my white mineral from processing. So it's a trade-off depending on economics, really. So, uh, this is a schematic of the rare earth uh, separator. I have a vibro feeder, hopper arrangement here, feed into my hopper from a chute, and to the vibro feeder. It's a wide, it's a short pan wide vibro feeder. Often these uh, roll separators are a meter wide. So all I'm aiming to do with this is get a control feed of material onto my belt. The feed belt has the purpose of feeding material on in a mono layer to the permanent magnetic front pulley of the separator. Um, the belt then feeds material on and then removes the, ma the magnetic fraction into an area here where the field of influence of the magnetic field drops off as we move further away from the roll and my magnetics will fall off accordingly. The, the, the roll then goes back to the idler pulley at the back and feeds back on again. We often have a, a, a brush here to clean the, the belt should we be picking up any dust on the surface in, if we have a degree of fines in our feed material. So I want a mono layer of material going on the surface. If I have uh, more than a mono layer, then separation efficiency begins to drop off because my particles are further away from the roll surface, which means they're getting less field strength and less field gradient, which means the separation efficiency will drop. Also, the more particles I have in the, in the separating zone here, where particles sort themselves out into being magnetic and non-magnetic, then I'm going to get particle-particle interaction hitting each other and a displacement of particles which would begin to re, uh, give me a less clear-cut separation. So monolayer is very important in the process. How do I generate my magnetic field strength on the surface of my, my front pulley? We do it, it's a permanent magnetic system, um, and we do it by uh, opposing uh, magnetic disks of neodymium boron iron 
uh, very powerful rare earth magnets. So we have our pole shaft here and we, on the shaft are mounted pole pieces which are the blue material here and magnets which are our um, cream coloured material here. As you will see I oppose south pole to south pole, north pole to north pole and if you remember forcing magnets together uh, you know, in, a, in, in physics classes they, they repel each other greatly and that has the effect of kicking the magnetic field out onto the surface of the roll here like that. So these are locked together under compression which, so it's quite a complex manufacturing task to make these things. They're glued and compressed and locked off and this kicks out a very high field strength and high field gradient onto the surface of the roll and hence onto the surface of the belt. We have different roll designs depending on the particle size range of the material that we're processing. So for a coarse particle like the red particle here which might be 10 millimeters in size, we tend to, to run uh, with very wide magnets here and wide pole pieces here. That has the effect of kicking the magnetic field out further from the roll surface, which means that I can capture the center of gravity of this particle, which is going to be at about five, five uh, millimeters. I can capture all the particle, which gives me an improved separation performance. The magnetic force at the center of gravity of the particle is going to be high because I've kicked the field strength out further. For a fine particle like a one millimeter and below silica sand, then there's absolutely no point in kicking out the magnetic field to 10 millimeters or so. We run with narrower pole pieces and narrower magnets here, which means I concentrate my magnetic field much closer to the surface of the roll, uh, which means that I'm hitting the center of gravity of my green particle with the maximum field strength and field gradient I can get uh, and this improves the separation performance. So whilst they are permanent magnetic roll separators we can design the roll by changing the, the, uh, the magnet diameters and the pole pieces accordingly for coarse particle processing and fine particle processing. Just a final reminder of the principle of operation. So when I'm separating a sample in the laboratory, I will run it over the, uh, the roll. I will set the roll speed. Um, the roll speed will determine the trajectory of the non-magnetic material because that's uh, controlled by the mass, the velocity squared, divided by the radius of the roll here. So that gives me that trajectory there. Um, the, the trajectory of the magnetic particles is a function of the magnetic force I generate and the magnetic susceptibility and the particle size range that I have. I will also have my middling fraction here. So my control variables really for separation are the roll speed because that will give me my trajectory there but also the splitter plate position. So if, if my grade of material coming off in the non-magnetics is not good enough, I need to remove more paramagnetic particles. I may well change my splitter plate position and cut it up here, the splitter plate. So material that is arcing like that will hit the splitter plate and bounce into the middling fraction like that. That way I can take a bigger middling fraction out, which will be particles that are of composite nature that might only have a very little magnetic material in it. So likewise, if I'm taking too much magnetic material out, I can move my splitter blade and cut it in at that point there and take more to the middlings fraction here and then recombine those accordingly. So the flexibility with the separation is belt speed, which is roll speed, uh, uh, versus splitter plate position. Okay, so this is a diagram of a meter wide double roll unit. I'll just point out a few of the, this is an industrial unit used for silica sand. So we feed into the hopper at the top here. Uh, gated hopper drops onto the vibro feeder. You can see it's a meter wide, short pan meter wide, highly controllable vibro feeder. The aim of that is to give you a nice steady feed across the whole width of the unit onto the first roll. 
These are the roll. These uh, these are the belts here. This is the feed belt for the roll. Uh, feeds on to the first roll, and non magnetics are thrown off onto the second roll here. A magnetic fraction is taken off by the splitter plate into our mags, our first mags here. So our non magnetics from the first pass go to the second pass of the unit. Non magnetics come off here. Our magnetics are taken off here, second pass magnetics. And that will be removed in this case because it's silica sand processing. Um, other things to notice, these the yellow caps here are the front and back uh, bearings. Here and here. We have belt adjustment and tensioner here. Um, and we have splitter plate adjustment here and here and here as well. We need splitter plate adjustment because if we're especially uh, you know, in an industrial mining application, then as you mine across a quarry, the feed grade will change, the quality of the material changes. So the client must be able to adjust accordingly as the feed quality changes of your material. It gives them the ultimate flexibility. Um, this machine will come with a control panel, which will control the vibro feed and the belt speeds of the units um, accordingly. It's also, you can see it's quite a modular design uh, and it can even be mounted on wheels and casters. Um, and for batch processing application, like a ceramics plant, where you're taking different feed materials for a ceramic feed, uh, for, for pottery manufacturing or something, then you can move it from, from um, hopper to hopper to batch process the material to clean it as it comes, uh, comes in. So these are very flexible materials, very easy to fit and get running on site. Uh, as well. So the key facts about these separators are we have a large particle size range processed from 15 millimeters down to 75 microns in size range. The equivalent electromagnetic unit, the induced roll separator, will only process minus two millimeter material because of the roll pole gap. So this has a much more flexible top end um, of, of, of processing. It does, however, become compromised if you have too much fine material in your feed. Because of the, the, the uh, belt material, it can generate some static uh, attraction on very fine particles. And what happens with those is they will stick on the belt surface and be carried round into the magnetics, which will compromise your separation. It might give you some losses. So we do need to control the fines in the material. We have adjustable belt speed and thickness of belt as well for more challenging applications. We have a double, we've just looked at the double roll option. The, ma the maximum magnetic field strength is about 1.4 Tesla. That's compared to about 2.2 Tesla in the induced magnetic roll, the electro version of this. Um, that's not such a problem when you consider that we actually generate very high field gradients in the, induce, in the uh, rare earth roll separator, and they are higher than are generated in the electro and magnetic equivalent, the induced roll. So when you look at a combination of field strength and field gradient, they give equivalent performance on a lot of applications. What we tend to do is if we have a sample, we will test them on both machines and then recommend to the client the, what we feel is the best alternative for that particular application or give them the results and let them choose whether they prefer the permanent magnetic option or the electromagnetic option. There are pluses and minuses in both and we'll look at that at the end of the presentation. We have different roll designs that we've talked about and we also have different roll diameters that we can supply depending on throughputs and the customer's requirements. Low operating cost because you're only powering a vibro feeder and the belt drive system. Small machine footprint, they're easy to install, they can be flexible, you can put them on casters and move them around your site. And we have a high capacity per tonne available. Typical applications, the majority of applications really are removal of iron minerals from silica sands, feldspars, etc. for industrial minerals applications in the ceramics industry, in, as fillers for plastics, as fillers for paper manufacture, and as fillers in microfibrillated cellulose, which is a new application for these materials, and which is likely to take off over the next 10, 15 years, as microfibrillated cellulose becomes a replacement for plastics and paper in some more 
uh, industrial applications, more technically challenging applications. It's also used in the processing of uh, abrasives, both in the primary processing of garnet sands for, for shot firing applications, but also in the recycling of these materials where we're trying to get rid of any um, impurities that have been generated in the shot blasting process so you can reuse your abrasive rather than having to buy new material. In ceramics industry, these are used on the product from a spray dryer where we're feeding a ceramic slurry into a spray dryer to get fine pelleted material for pressing in a um, ceramics manufacturing process. The spray dried product is usually about oh, minus 500 microns in size range, but it can contain very fine iron that has been generated in the spray drying process. So as a final cleaner before dry pressing and firing, then uh, we can use the rare earth roll separator to remove those. In plastics processing, pelletized plastic prior to um, extrusion can be cleaned. Again, uh, here we're removing iron that has been present uh, in the manufacturing process of the plastic pellets and they need, that needs to be removed before the high temperature extrusion process is used because that will, con that will compromise the quality control of the extruded product. Finally, urban waste. We're beginning to see these types of separators used in urban waste processing. For example, in granulated uh, cable below two millimeters in size range, um, it can be used to remove uh, stainless steel from these products if you want a stainless steel concentrate or if you want to um, remove the stainless steel to get a better grade of copper or aluminium um, and get more money per tonne for, for that particular product. It'll even remove normally non-magnetic uh, stainless steels, 300 series, simply because due the, the mere process of shredding and granulation on a 300 series stainless steel will work harden it and the process of the work hardening and stressing that material engenders a, ma a paramagnetic nature to that uh, stainless steel. So it, it is then becomes susceptible to removement on the rare earth roll separator. Final application and one that is really for the future, although we're beginning to see plants spring up over uh, Europe um, in the last year or so to start reprocessing and recycling uh, batteries from uh, electric vehicles as your electric vehicle battery uh, drive battery begins to uh, compromise its performance and drop below 80% then your range drops and the charging time increases which means they have to be replaced by the manufacturer these replaced batteries um, either go for reuse, hopefully, or recycling. And uh, the rare earth roll separator can play a key part in the recycling of these batteries to maintain the uh, cost effective and sustainable uh, production of electric vehicles going forward as their, market, uh, as their market increases. So the first application we're going to look at for capacities is minerals. This is per meter wide unit. Uh, for, for silica sand, we're looking at somewhere between three and five tons per hour. For a more dense material like ilmenite, we're looking up to six tons per hour where the specific gravity of the materials in the region of four to 4.5. The capacity is usually principally affected by the particle size range. The coarser of the particle size range, the higher the capacity because our mono layer is greater uh, and it allows us to process more material through. So for typical capacities for waste processing, our granulated cable applications, because this is quite a coarse material uh, and also because it's high density, up to five tonnes per hour, our shredded lithium ion car batteries much lower. These are foil electrodes that we're using and it's low density material, uh, uh, high volume. So our, our capacity is down at one tonne per hour. This is a picture of the laboratory unit that uh, we, we do our test work on. Um, it's Bunting Redditch. So here we have the vibro feeder feeding onto the belt surface. The belt, the roll design is, say, is the same as a uh, meter wide industrial unit. It is just a, a, a much lower width. So I get the same performance uh, as you would do on an industrial unit. 
the belt feeds on, I can control the, uh, the roll speed via the control panel here. I can control and get my mono layer by controlling the uh, vibro feeder there. I adjust, so having set a roll speed that gives a reasonable throw of non-magnetics, I then adjust my splitter plates here and here to get my, uh, to cut into the streams of material leaving the separator to get the sort of separation that I think the client is looking for. I will then take those samples away, test them on the X-ray fluorescence machine that we have in the laboratory, look at the, uh, the chemistry of what we're doing, uh, compare that with what the customer requires, then make changes accordingly. I might give it a second pass if the iron level is not down high enough, or I might adjust the, if I'm quite close to what the customer needs, I will adjust the splitter plates positions to try to see if I can get it in one pass, thereby uh, making the most economic solution for the, the particular customer. Should be said that often customers will come for the testing and witness that with us, and then we can talk much better do it that way, because that way we can talk with them at the time, find out exactly what they want. They can look at the analysis as we do it, and then we can make the adjustments in real time and, and, and actually come to a conclusion often at the end of a day's testing on what is the best option for that particular application. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple of videos. The first is for silica sand processing. Here I have a glass sand uh, product, a potential glass sand product. I want it has uh, uh, mineral contamination. It has ilmenite, iron titanate, which is highly magnetic, paramagnetic in nature. It has a biotite mica, which is a flaky uh, mica containing iron and manganese. Um, it's a black coloured flaky mica, so consequently is going to compromise the iron content, but also the colour of the silica sand. And this silica sand wants to go for clear glass manufacture. There will also be some iron stain quartz, or iron cane silica sand. And that is a material that is a quirk of the geology of this deposit. Over millions of years, percolating water has dissolved some of the iron from the ilmenite. Uh, that's gone into solution and then re-precipitated out on the surface of the silica sand grains. So we have, a, we have a grain of sand that has a coating of iron oxide on it, almost like rust. And again, if that's not removed, that's going to compromise the iron level in the silica sand. Um, so that, and also compromise the colour of the sand as well. Um, so consequently, we need to try to remove that as well. So highly magnetic, medium magnetic, very weakly magnetic, silica sand, non-magnetic. The objective is to get below about 0.2% Fe. So hopefully we have a, um, a video of the test. Okay, so that's the, the master roll unit, the, uh, the roll unit. The feeding material, and I'll set up the belt speed to give me a, a good discharge of non-magnetics there. You can see the flow of non-magnetics there coming off, and the magnetics you can't see, but it's coming off here, off the material. So uh, here are my non-magnetic fraction, nice white mineral, clear mineral. It's quite a coarse material for this particular application, it has to be said. And our dark minerals, our ilmenite, uh, biotite mica and quartz are here. So you can see a nice clear separation demarcation between the two. Might need a second pass, but, but you know, the, that's entirely possible. The second application is, um, is for urban waste. This is my shredded aluminium uh, and carbon cathode and anode material. So it's shredded lithium ion car batteries. I have my cathodic material, which is aluminium foil for current collection. But this aluminium foil is covered with cobalt and nickel oxides, which are highly magnetic in nature. So whilst I have my aluminium, it is coated with a, a metal oxide that is magnetic. So my cathode is magnetic. My anode is copper foil covered with graphite. So it's non-magnetic. So I have a magnetic and a non-magnetic fraction. So consequently, I want to separate those. The machine, the, the, the shredded pouches will have already gone over an eddy current separator. 
which will remove most of the plastics from the uh, an and cathodic material. So I'm taking the thrown material from an eddy current separator because, because we have aluminium and copper here, they're both thrown and I'm now going to process them over the rare earth roll to get an anode concentrate and a cathode concentrate that can go for further downstream processing. Just a quick up, this is a, a pouch from a, uh, a a, a, a lithium-ion car battery. So there's my copper foil, my coating, my aluminium foil, and my cathodic coatings on here. So we have electrolyte separator here, which is plastic, it's like osmosis, and there are lots of plastic in here as well. The electrolyte allows the passage of the lithium between dissolved lithium ions between the anode and the cathode, but over a period of time, impurities build up which compromises the efficiency of this change and transportation, which means that your battery takes longer to charge. And also your discharge becomes uh, compromised and the range of your electric vehicle will drop. So you might go down from 220 mile, miles before discharge to 150. When it gets to a certain point, about 80% efficiency, your manufacturer of your electric vehicle will replace your batteries with new ones and the replaced scrapped batteries will either be reused for another application or recycled safely uh, and the valuable material, the cobalt and the nickel and the copper and the aluminium and the graphite are all recovered for reuse uh, in reuse in new battery products. And that's essential, really, when you consider the, the market penetration of electric vehicles that's likely to have in the next decade. We have got to have a recycling uh, system in place for these materials. And that's what's being developed across Europe at the moment. Simply because cobalt and nickel are sustainable uh, minerals that um, uh, are only mined in a few places around the world. So it gives, it gives the EU and the UK some sort of independence to uh, fluctuations in in, um, in the market. So again, this is my shredded scrap material coming on to here. Uh, so it's anode and cathodic material. Feeding on, uh, again, slow belt speed, that's why I get a low capacity. So hopefully you can see material being thrown here and material sticking on the surface and coming off, really very magnetic. And that's the influence of the cobalt and the nickel in the process. I'm not really getting a middling fraction to any intents and purposes because it's sticking so well to the surface of the roll. And this is my copper and graphite coming off here and my aluminium, cobalt and nickel coming off here. It's the only way you can separate anodic and cathodic materials from a shredded lithium ion car battery. These would then go for separate processing, the copper and graphite for processing to recover those. And this would go for recovery of nickel and cobalt and then recovery of the aluminium afterwards. It's always easier and more cost effectively to physically separate as far as possible down a flow sheet before you start using chemistry or pyrometallurgy to recover things. Final slide you'll be pleased to know and this is a, this is, is a comparison of induced rubble magnetic separator to the rare earth magnetic separator. So I say they're very similar uh, for applications uh, and uh, can be both be used on many applications and it's really a case of which the customer prefers. So maximum field strength 2.2 Tesla for the induced roll, 1.4 for the rare earth roll. Field gradient medium for the induced roll, high for the rare earth roll. So they really give equivalent type performances on a lot of applications. Particle size range, the limit on the induced roll is the roll pole gap, which we've talked about in another one of these technical overviews. Um, so it's really below two millimeters inside. The rare earth roll can go up to 15 millimeters because it has no such restriction. Size range, the induced roll can go down to about 45 microns. The rare earth roll down to about 100, 125 microns uh, in nature. So more flexibility at the bottom end in the induced roll. Double size option, yes for both. Power requirements is more for the induced roll because it's an electro uh, magnet. 
but it does give you infinite variability. Uh, and you're talking about 2.5 uh, kilowatts per meter wide unit difference in power requirement. Feed options. Vibro feed is a preferred for both. Lower gated hopper can be used for the induced roll. Back to back options. No for the induced roll. Sorry, yes for the induced roll. No for the rare earth roll. Scalping magnet needed. Yes, please. In an ideal world, it makes a lot of sense to have a scalping magnet. Hot feed. The induced roll can take material that's been through a dryer and still warm up to about 100 degrees centigrade without compromising its performance. The rare earth roll cannot do that simply because these are permanent magnets and permanent magnets have Curie temperatures and as they get hotter their performance becomes less uh, and they become less strong because of this heating process. Uh, so we prefer to use it at ambient temperature where possible. Adjustable magnetic field. Yes, you have an infinitely variable magnetic field from zero up to 2.2 Tesla in the induced roll. Uh, no, in the rare earth roll, it is a permanent magnetic separator. Uh, control variables are belt speed and splitter plate position. Uh, middlings option, yes in both. Roller speed adjustment, yes in both. So really, it's the best one. There's not a better unit. It's not the best unit in general. It's the best unit for your particular application. And that's the purpose of test work uh, uh, and testing on both is to find out which works better for you. So that concludes the talk. Thank you for your attention. I uh, hope it's been of, of, of interest to you. Um, and if you have any further questions or you would like some test work um, carried out, then please contact us via the website. Thank you.